Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. In a moment, we're going to go into an interview with Kristen, who identifies as an INTP personality type. A few things to keep in mind before we get started. First, we may use some shorthand and technical language in this interview. So if you want to download a handy guide that will help you visually follow along, visit personalityhacker.com and you can find that PDF directly below this episode. Second, I just want to draw attention to the fact that Kristen has been through our profiler training program. She knows herself and she knows type very well. So with this in mind, we want to encourage you to look past any stereotypes you may have for the INTP personality. If you're brand new to type, I stands for introvert, N stands for intuitive, T stands for thinker, P stands for perceiver. These four letters are called dichotomies, and they are what most people know about personality type. That might be what you know about type. But the true power of the system comes from understanding personality on a much deeper level. And these are called the cognitive functions. And in this interview with Kristen, we're going to go ahead and dive deeper into the cognitive functions as we talk with her. To get an overview of the INTP cognitive functions, one of the easiest places to start is to search for a previous podcast we've recorded. It's titled INTP Personality Type Advice. Cognitive functions can be a bit technical at times, so I just want to remind you there's that handy PDF guide directly below this episode. Go over to personalityhacker.com and you can go ahead and get that guide there. This week, we have a special guest on the show, Kristen Hebel. Kristen, welcome to Personality Hacker. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. In fact, we invited you on because you your best fit type in the Myers-Briggs system is INTP. And not only is that your best fit type, but you've also been on our profiler training program. You've been around the community for a while. You know type pretty well. And what's interesting about you, not just knowing type, but being an INTP, you're also a female INTP. So you're a woman that identifies as an INTP, meaning that you have probably a little different experience than maybe your your guy counterparts, I guess, if you if you will. So we want to talk to you today about type, maybe some of your growth journey in personality type and what it's like to be an INTP woman. But before we do that, what do we need to know about Kristen before we get started? All right. Yeah. Um, so I am in my mid 30s and I'm currently a stay at home mom of two young girls. Before that, I have been a STEM girl working in um, IT. And then before that, microbiology, food safety, all of that stuff for about a decade. So Kristen, how did you discover type? And then how did you discover that your best fit type is INTP? In college in the mid 2000s, uh, my roommate actually had the what type of my book and let me borrow it. And I just looked through and immediately, immediately just looking at the letters, I knew I was an INTP. Like I was so stereotypically an INTP. It was embarrassing. <laughs> so um, huh. yeah, it was, it was a pretty exciting discovery on my behalf of like, oh, I'm not, I'm not crazy. I'm not whatever. Like there are people that are out there like me. What do you mean when you say I was a stereotypical INTP? So of just the dichotomies, I'm extremely at the time, at the time I was extremely introverted, very, very intuitive, like kind of out there with my uh, with the way that I presented myself, definitely for the thinker feeler dichotomy, I did not understand anything about feelings at all. <laughs> and then for uh, judge or perceiver, my life was a very uh, explosive mess. I would I would say for for the stereotype of those dichotomies. Mm. So unlike some people who had a journey of originally identifying with not their best fit type or being mistyped and having to figure it out over time, like from the get go, from day one, from moment one, your best fit type was INTP. Right. So then from finding that out, what I would do is research typology and find every online quiz that I possibly could and would take it for a while. I was taking it like every couple months or every six months just to make sure that I was still an INTP because 
it made sense. Like, okay, am I still, does type change? Am I still an IGP? Yes, I am. Yes. Then I'm assuming that you went from just understanding, like you said, the dichotomies into a more fleshed out understanding of cognitive functions and your mental processes. Yes. So did that open anything up for you when you discovered those mental processes? Yes, because what ended up happening was when I discovered my type, I was like, oh, everybody needs to know about this. Like this unlocks so many like mysteries that I didn't understand before. So let me tell everybody and let me type everybody. I had no understanding of the cognitive functions at the time. And it actually wasn't until your guys's podcast that I understood what the cognitive functions were because of the car model. So I had seen them online and people like explaining them. And I kind of understood, but I didn't fully grasp it until you explain the car model. Understanding that you lead with, say, introverted thinking or accuracy, an extroverted feeling or harmony is your three-year-old or inferior function. And and putting that together with maybe uh, the the statistics around, you know, how um, women have a tendency to be feelers and uh, more women are, you know, wired for extroverted feeling or harmony. Did that unlock some some things for you, sort of understanding that you're wired very differently from other women? Yes. So what actually ended up happening prior to discovering um, the cognitive functions and just understanding the dichotomy of thinking and feeling, also in being in STEM as a woman, I didn't really understand what other women were complaining about when they would talk about things that were unfair or whatever because I was the one that was typically doing the mansplaining um so when I was like oh this is something that's valid people having feelings I was like maybe there is something to be said about having emotions and leading with that and what is there that is valuable to that. So I spent about eight years studying women, just like interacting with them and trying to understand, okay, if half the population are women, then there there has to be something important there, right? <laughs> wow. So if there are so many so, of us, there must be a reason. <laughs> right. I mean, it can't just be procreation. It has, to, you know, there has to be there has to be a reason. So then I was like, okay, well, what is, what is the value there? And so I spent a lot of time just like really like interacting with women and understanding that like there is value in recognizing what your emotions are and expressing them and having these like social interactions. Because of that, I am actually a bit more social than I would say the typical INCP. Mm. You know, it's it's interesting. It's almost hard not to conflate all these ideas together because it's like, well, not all women are feelers. And yet right. when you are a woman and a thinker woman and you run into so many women who feel like they're so different than you, it's it's easy to start conflating these concepts together, even though they're really not the same thing. But to find our place as a fellow NTP, to find our place in all of this, it's almost like you have to see the matrix of femininity as being a place of valuing sort of the like emotions and the human experience and connectivity with each other. And so even though they're not they're not a one to one correlation, there's still this this place we have to navigate, you know, as NCP women that feels like we just didn't get the memo. That's exactly how I felt is like before I discovered type, I would only hang out with guys like I only had guy friends and I had heard other girls who only hung out with guys be like, oh, yeah, I don't like hanging out with girls. Girls are too much drama. And I was like, oh, that's something that maybe that's how I feel. Yeah, I don't like drama. But really what it was is I could not actually connect with other women. Um, I didn't understand the social cues. I didn't understand the gossip thing. I didn't understand that that was a form of communication. I didn't really 
have the full range of emotion, like even excitement or anger or like any of the main emotions that I would see expressed, I couldn't relate to that. And so I was like, oh, well, then it must be because I don't like drama. That's what it is when that wasn't actually what it was at all. Did you ever have women come along and try to help you and uh, say, hey, let me let me show you how this works? Uh, no, um, I did. I did as far as like the made over nerd. That was like a huge thing where <laughs> because I am a fairly attractive female. So what they would do is at sleepovers, they would, oh, let's make you over. I know that you would just. So they put me in dresses and curl my hair and put my makeup on for me and all of that stuff. Oh, dear Lord. Yeah. So it was just about the physical appearance, but never on like an emotional level at all. Mm. I want to go back to what you said before. There's it, there's a style. I know what you're talking about. I think they often call them pick me girls Yeah, where, yep. you know, they're they're like a. I'm not like other women, right? And right. it's almost like a competitive advantage to mm-hmm. be to to distance yourself from the matrix of femininity and be like I'm I'm somehow better than because I'm, you know, like I'm not like the other women. Right. And what I hear you saying is that there was a part of you that's like am I like those women is that is that what's going on? But it's actually it wasn't that at all. It was that when you were hanging out with other women, again, it's like uh, the way I always see it is like other women got the memo and I didn't. And they don't know right. that I didn't get the the memo. So we're all acting as if I should be knowing something that I'm doing my best to play along with knowing. But I'm I'm missing something. I'm missing some piece of information. And so what I well, hear. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, not only that, but it, as far as like with the pick me mentality is I was like, oh, that is a valid expression of femininity. So that must be what I'm doing and mm. didn't view anything wrong with it at the time. Mm. Yeah. Uh, oh, that that's it. That's what I'm doing. But that wasn't actually what was going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's interesting that you I, and I think pretty um, maybe even predictive that you said, well, I think I'm going to instead of d- dismissing this or thinking I'm better than I'm going to study this and f- and see what I can figure out. So can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you discovered as you were in that study mode of the like, okay, I'm going to, there's something important here. Obviously women bring very valuable content to the world. It's not just that women are just here for procreation, like you said. Right. <laughs> there's like right. some really cool, valid things here. Oh, uh, Right. What did that look like for you going through that observation and study time period? Okay, so what I ended up doing was taking those lessons that I learned during sleepovers of, you know, making myself more attractive and then getting into the uh, hyper feminine kind of like girly, stereotypically girly activities where I would, I, I didn't really go clubbing at all, but I would hang out with women. We would go out and uh, do like half off appetizers at Applebee's and um, like just I interact with them. And because I looked like them, I was able to then mimic some of the some of the actions or like some of the phrases I picked up. And obviously the way that I'm speaking as well, I have definitely kept some of those tendencies. But the things that I learned that were really important were that the way that these particular women talked to each other and related to each other, I, I'm trying to figure out how to how to explain this best. It's like your emotions aren't your enemy. They're not actually negative things. And later I would like come back and like reflect on, okay, well, what do I feel? Like what what is an emotion? <laughs> what am I feeling? What am I, what am I experiencing when I tap into these things? Because in the past, prior to typology, prior to the study, I would literally just explode out of nowhere with anger. Like I would be fine, 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 fine for 
a really long time and then just be overwhelmed with crying, overwhelmed with anger, overwhelmed with these uh, these negative emotions. And I had no way to control it. So when I would watch these women get upset over like smaller things and express it, and then they weren't really like bad about it afterwards, it seemed like I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe if you feel it when it's happening, then it doesn't build up over time. Like if you cry about stuff when you're upset about it, then you won't just be in a conversation with somebody and start sobbing. So it was a way for me to like learn to manage my emotions better in a more realistic or in a more manageable way, I guess. Mm. Yeah, we're we're taking this subject and looking at it very much through the lens of you being an INCP woman, but I don't think that that has anything to do with necessarily being, you know, an INCP woman. This is just being an INCP, right? Looking yeah. for a place in life that will help you uh, give yourself permission to go through emotional expression in order for your emotions to not stack. And I think that that's sometimes, particularly for people who lead with the thinking function, that can be a really difficult lesson to learn because there's always the sense that emotions are going to cloud your thinking. They are they feel like your enemy because whenever you're in a, a, a strong emotional state, well, you can't think clearly and thinking clearly is your strategy for getting through life. And so I, I would imagine that as an INTP, watching other people not deny their emotions, but regulate them and make it so that they don't have these extreme moments of being completely out of a thinking place. I bet that that was, uh, it seems like that was a big leverage point. Yeah, yeah, it was a huge help for me. So as as you were navigating through all of this, um, I'm assuming that um, discovering, you know, as an INTP, when you learned about cognitive functions, more fidelity about how your mind is wired was then, you know, available to you. Can you talk a little bit about maybe how you started understanding your other functions, not just introverted thinking or the value of the feeling function, which would for you be your three-year-old or inferior, but also just like your relationship with intuition and your your relationship with your sensing parts. Like, um, can you talk a little bit about your your awareness around how your mind is wired in those ways? For me, exploration is really a good friend of mine, I would like to say. I view it as magic, uh, as it being magical. And the way that that has expressed itself is through my interests. So my degree is in biology, and there's something about discovering how things work, even though you can map it out even though you can dissect these things, there's still something so mysterious about life, just life in general and how things are alive and how things grow and how things manifest. And that is so exciting to me. Practically how it's expressed itself in other ways is I love to travel. I love to like try new things, put myself out there and just experience things and see what happens although uh that was not always the case before we go to when you became a better friend or you start started to see your intuition as a better friend i think that's something uh, that's really interesting that part of why you like it is because it keeps the magic and the mystery like as a fellow ntp and somebody using introverted thinking or accuracy i know that there's this idealistic bent to that function that wants to get the answers to everything, right? Like they, it wants to know. But that intuitive part of you keeps, like it reminds you that there are things that are unexplained and that there are, there's mystery and magic, it sounds like. And how do, you, how do you balance that with the part of you that wants to know everything? I'm not really sure if balance is the right word. It's just like you learn everything that you possibly can. And then once you reach that point where it's like, okay, I cannot learn any more about this subject. Like I can no longer grasp this thing with my two hands. And then you just let go. And then when you let go, it's like, that's when it becomes magical to me is at that very end where it's like, I cannot control this anymore. And then when you let go, it's like, wow, this is, (laughs) 
this is where the magic is. This is, this is what makes it so special. And then it just becomes more of like awe, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this sounds hard one. You said there's a moment before or moments before a life before that you didn't have access to this as your friend. Yeah. I was definitely scared of it because there is a desire to want to know everything and, and want to be the smartest person in the room and want to want to be the expert on whatever topic. And oftentimes, whenever I am talking about something, I am the only person in the room that cares about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, whenever I come across somebody that also is interested in this thing, then it becomes, I don't know, it just, it's so exciting. It's so exciting when there is that just jump to exploration, I guess. So you are in STEM, you're in microbiology. I'm guessing there's an avenue for some of your best your best traits to come and be highlighted. That accuracy, driver, introverted thinking, combined with that exploration or extroverted intuition. I'm guessing that in the STEM world, in the fields you were in, that was welcome. You were allowed to bring that forward. Am I, am I on the right track on that? Yes. But I also know that you were part of a very strong faith background. And yes. in there is probably a little bit more socially focused and some more, maybe, maybe it doesn't pull on your strengths or give you as much opportunity for your strengths. You're also in that world too. Is that correct? That is correct. So you almost have these, these dichotomous worlds you're a part of. And was that a weird experience for you as an INTP to kind of go between the, the social, religious, faith experience and then come over to STEM and then go back? It's like, it almost feels to me like it would be for, for an INTP, it'd be like going from hot and cold water back and forth in a way. Yes, I grew up in an uh, evangelical setting, and it has been very, very challenging for me, especially when I was younger, because I actually read the Bible <laughs> and studied it and cared about it. And so whenever I would be in these church settings, I felt like an Old Testament prophet standing on the mountaintop telling everyone, hey, uh, you're doing it wrong. Like, have you even read this book? Because you're acting like you haven't. <laughs> so literally just feeling like I was the only person of my age group, the only person in my church, the only person in my family that actually had a grasp on things reading the text. I would just tell people that they were wrong all the time. <laughs> which probably didn't go over very well in that kind of environment. I mean, there's a, uh, yeah, I grew up no. there too. There's a, there's a social component that you kind of, you go along with what's happening. You don't want to rock the boat. You want to be in harmony in this setting. Right. You know, we're trying to be here to create fellowship, maybe reach people for, for our faith and things of that nature. You don't want to really create a lot of discord, distinctions, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, truth is right. okay, but not when it's going to cause trouble in, a, in an environment like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um... No, I did not really fit. I still don't really fit in well in church settings, even though I still identify as a Christian. I think that, uh, well, and you, and then I was just going to say, you went from being in a STEM situation career wise to being a stay at home mom, which also pulls on maybe some of those functions that are a little further down the stack, right? Like the backseat passengers oh. in your car model. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yep. So going from a very highly academic setting to raising two small children has been extremely challenging for me. The thing is, it is a priority to me to stay at home. It is. However, it is not easy for me. This is not this is not a natural setting. <laughs> mm. So this is um, a stretch. Yes. Yes. This is definitely a growth point for me right now. Yeah. And how's it going? Uh, it's going. <laughs> <laughs> um, the hardest part is, you know, at the time of this recording, we are in a pandemic. And so a lot of things that I thought that I was going to do with taking my girls to museums and the library and these activities where I could go out into the world and have them experience things, you know, 
my daughter was born right before the pandemic really hit. And so, yeah, that part's been pretty rough. And then trying to find groups of other stay-at-home moms that are like-minded is nigh impossible. So I am kind of winging it on my own out here. And I am just pretty much doing the best I can. Mm -hmm. It's a priority for you, and yet it is difficult. I understand that when your values and your talents and skills come clashing together. Yeah. And uh, and so it's important, it's a priority enough for you to continue to do it, but it sounds like it's it's it doesn't just sound like it's pulling on, you know, your quote-unquote backseat, your extroverted feeling, harmony, your introverted sensing, your memory, trying to uh, create some stability for your kids. But it also sounds like it's pulling on a lot of your extroverted intuition or ex exploration as well, because you're kind of having to patch it together as you go. Yeah. So so something that that I use as like a method for gathering information is I ask for advice from a lot of different people from a lot of different stages of life. And I just boil down all of that information to things that apply to my circumstances. So in addition to being in STEM, I did a little stint where I was a high school teacher for a couple of years. And so I was under the impression that like with homeschooling, I needed to have lesson plans written out. I needed to have a scope and sequence for each subject that I was teaching, that I had to have all of these, like I had to keep grades and I had to do all of this stuff. And so I'm like, talking with other teachers. I'm talking with other homeschool moms. I'm talking to women who are just moms of small children. And uh, they're like, uh, you're doing, you're thinking what? And just calibrating my expectations. I literally don't even have to register my kids for school until they turn six. So, and then I looked up the standards for the state that I live in. And there are None of these expectations that I had put upon myself. And once I learned that, I was like, oh, wow, maybe we could just play outside. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you speak to the struggle of INTPs is that there's this balance. There's this almost it's hard to get a handle around how much do you tap into the external world and the, the things that are set for you out here, the standards and the metrics. How much should you take that upon yourself? Versus how much should you do it on your own and be creative and figure it out? And I think a lot of INTPs struggle with that balance because there's some value in the external systems in the world and the, and the social expectations and things, but there's also value in doing it yourself. But I've seen some INTPs that go too far in the independent route. They don't play nice with others, quote unquote, and they end up maybe not having the success they want or the they have challenges with motivation or whatever. They're too much on their own. But then there's others that are too tapped in. They hand themselves over to the social system as well. It sounds like you're finding that balance between those two extremes. Yeah. Well, and I would like to ask, what for for you, what do you think that balance is? In part of discovering my type and also learning to be more social and learning to, you know, be in society, in the workforce and stuff like that, I learned that for me, watching and observing how other people have done it in the past is really helpful for me, but I view it as a resource. So instead of relying so heavily on it and saying, oh, everybody is doing it like this, this is how I have to do it. I take it as a resource and say, oh, this is how some people do it, but I don't have to do it that way. Maybe I can take a few things from here, a few things from there and utilize it to my best interest. Uh, the best example that I have for that is in care tasks or like house chores type situations where I see see a bunch of different systems of like, oh, have a chore chart or have certain days where you do one thing each day. And that is not really a method that has worked for me. So I have decided that, oh, something that is helpful is the dishes have to be done every day. At the end of the day, if that's the only thing that I get done, dishes cleared from the sink, that's it. Mm. And then I have one day that I 
only do laundry and that's it. Mm -hmm. And if things, if the family members do not bring me laundry, that laundry does not get done. And if you need it done, you do it yourself. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. Okay, so here's what I'm hearing from this. I'm hearing a core principle or, or a, a way to describe that 10-year-old or tertiary process of memory introverted sensing for you as an INTP. You're, what I hear you saying, instead of looking at the what's come before and the templates mm -hmm. and scripts and commands of society, you don't see it like that. You don't see it as a narrative you have to get on like the the eastern australian current in finding nemo like you don't have to f you don't have to get into that current and just ride it like like right it's being told to you what you're doing is you're mining two things from that you're using what people have done before not as a as a command of what you should do but as data of what has come before and also you're looking through that data to find the leverage points like you said you're you know like dishes have to be done so that's the leverage point you've decided that's a leverage point you kick that data up to your, I'm guessing, to your accuracy or introverted thinking, and you go, yep, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to act upon that leverage point of data I'm mining out from all the narratives I'm listening to. Is that kind of how the process is working for you? Yes. And I would actually go ahead and pull in that I have previously, prior to getting married, prior to having kids, I had made like, I used to identify myself as not being domesticated. I can't cook. I can't clean. I don't do these things. Like <laughs> I am, I am undomesticated. I'm wild. You cannot tame me. And so I had made that a part of my identity, but like being an adult and functioning in my life, that was not serving me. That was not benefiting me in any way. I was functioning but there actually is something nice about coming into my bedroom and seeing my bed made. It is restful for me to be able to like get into fresh sheets, to shower regularly. There's the <laughs> INT, yes, the INTP stereotype of not having hygiene practices. That is so accurate to me of like, okay, I don't have to shower every day, but when I shower, wow, I feel better. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. So these things that I had, I had made around myself were, was actually just holding me back. I feel because having these things done, it was something that I didn't actually have to think about anymore because the S I F E still pulls like still has a hold of Oh, you should be doing like, you should have a clean house. You should shower. You should wear deodorant. <laughs> These are things that are still there. And it's like, no, at one point in time, I was like, I don't have to do that. I am, I can do whatever I want. And yeah, sure. You can, you can go out smelling like BO. That's fine. But what I, yeah, when you take care of yourself, for me personally, I do feel better about myself. Like, I do feel more comfortable in my skin. I do feel more confident carrying on conversations with people because I don't have to feel that worry or that fear that comes with the expectations of those backseat components judging me or pulling on me, I guess. So what you're talking about is that balancing act of your first two functions, your driver and co-pilot, and then your 10-year-old and your three-year-old. Because the challenge there is, or at least the challenge that I always experience is being somebody who's wired very similarly, is that I know that there are societal expectations. I know that there are things that I'm supposed to be doing and that society expects out of me. And sometimes I, I know it very clearly and I 
I'm not 100% sure how much I'm supposed to be obeying it. Like, is this something that's an expectation because it must be? Or is this something that it has more wiggle room? I don't have enough expertise in all of this in order to know which expectation I'm supposed to be following and which ones I can get away with. And so then I get an attitude, right? Like, because I'm not 100% sure this is a place of uncertainty for me. I get this attitude of like, well, you can't tell me what to do. (laughs) And then I go into that space where it's like, well, screw that. I'm going to do whatever I want. And then you discover, like what I hear you saying, Kristen, is that you discover, well, maybe that's not serving me either. So it's this, it's almost like a lifelong challenge of figuring out, okay, which rules is it a leverage point for me to observe and which expectations are the ones that are leverage points for me to tap into and go, okay, that's the thing I should be doing. Which ones are are ones that I can easily ignore? How punished do I get if I go my own way? And then how punished do I get if I just follow what everybody else's standards are? It's like this, it it requires this lifetime of experiences of ourselves to, to figure out which ones, which expectations am I married to? And that's actually that's actually unhealthy for me to be married to those. Which expectations am I ignoring? And it's unhealthy for me to ignore them. I actually should be tapping into those. It's almost a, uh, a trial and error throughout life to discover which ones, which ones am I really leaving money on the table if I have this attitude or, as you mentioned, an identity around ignoring and neglecting them. Right. Well, not only that, but it changes. At one point in time, I, you know, it was very uncomfortable for me to not shower. So I, you know, would shower very frequently. And then in motherhood, you kind of like, especially in those first few months, it's very challenging. It's very challenging to maintain that level of hygiene for me, at least, you know, when you're up late all hours and I, I breastfed. So feeding and you have a child that needs you, literally needs you for food, that did not, you know, I had to let that one go. And then now that I, you know, am my own person again for a while, I'm able to shower again frequently. But as far as like keeping up with the house and, you know, all of these domestic tasks, that stuff has, it's constantly changing with the needs of my family. And that is very overwhelming at times. Mm. Yeah, it's not a set it and forget it. There are seasons and cycles. I mean, we're talking about things as mundane as like bathing, right? <laughs> like, yeah. how often am I supposed to be hygienic? I don't know. Like, what do I figure? How do I figure that out? But I think that this principle can be extracted to literally every area of life. It's like, how much, how much small talk am I expected to do? Uh, how much like like in order to get the career that I want or maybe have career capital, what are the expectations I should be fulfilling? What are the ones I get to ignore? What career do I even choose? Right. And and are a bunch of societal expectations coming on me for what path I'm going to take or maybe my belief structure? What are the things right. I'm going to be believing? What are my uh, affiliations going to be in my ideologies? I mean, you can take this idea of like. As a mom, you have certain expectations placed on you as a mom to have your house in a certain way and to be presenting in a certain way. But I think that same principle applies no matter what area of life you find yourself in. Like your your particular where you're standing in life is going to come with it, come with a bunch of expectations about what it means to be in that space. And I think what you just mentioned is really important because if you forget that it's not static, that these things are on a timeline like sometimes, and, and I think this is really what it means to be a perceiver, is to be sensitive to those moments and those seasons and cycles. At this moment in the timeline, these are the expectations placed on me, and these are the ones that I'm going to be, I, I'm going to realize are not right for me. And then that might change later on. Later on, it might suddenly become right for me. So I need to not be too calcified in my identity around what I'm willing and unwilling to do. I 100% agree with that. Kristen, I want to circle back to something you mentioned a little earlier in the in the show. You had talked about you were observing women when you'd go out. You're observing other women and the way they would show up emotionally. You're like, oh, I see. They they have little emotional expressions throughout their day, throughout their experience, other people, and it doesn't stack and then explode. Oh, maybe I should try that. That's a really interesting idea for me. As an INTP, that's probably hard one that realization. 
what are, let's bring it down to the practical or tangible. Like what are some actual things that you do to help with that? Like, are there, are there action steps you take or are you just going out and like hanging out with people and crying? Like what, how do you actually process your emotions on a regular basis? Okay. So I still can't do it in real time. I cannot feel my emotions as they're happening often. So what I do is all like come home, take a shower or take a long, hot bath, listen to lo-fi beats and like chill and just give myself space. I, I mean, uh, the buzzword right now is a safe space. Maybe I'll light a candle and just like, okay, this is a time that I'm allowed to express emotion. Another really good method that I've used is I actually journal. So I will do uh, what some people call like a brain dump. And I will just write down everything that comes into my mind. And oftentimes that's enough for me to get whatever feeling is going. Sometimes I will call a friend. Hmm. I have an ENFP that will literally just, she's like my lifeline. I'll call her and be like, hey, I I think I'm upset about something, but I can't identify it. Can you help me identify <laughs> what I'm not only what I'm feeling, but what is triggering me, like what the issue is. Yeah. So those things, sometimes if I really, really need to cry and I like it's stuck, like if I'm sad and I can't figure out how to cry, then I'll put on a movie that I know is sad and we'll watch a sad movie to like trigger the tears to come. Mm. Even if it's not the thing that I'm like, I'm crying about the movie. I'm not crying over whatever I need to be crying about. It's enough for me. Okay, I got it out of my system. I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those ENFPs are handy, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they are. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I I make uh, a lot of use out of mine as well. Are you calling me a tool? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're trying to sneak in here? <laughs> well, but I think it, what's interesting and should be I uh, pointed out is that for some of us, emotions are distant. Like they're, mm -hmm. they're obscure and distant and they're not readily available. That's so and, weird. <laughs> and so in order to process emotionally, you have to go mine it out. You have to go find the emotion or, or get an approximation of it and then find mm -hmm. an outer world catalyst to start triggering that emotion. And it's not even a matter of, I'm not, I mean, for me at least, I haven't fought emotions in a long time. I have no interest in fighting them. I want them to come. And even when I invite them, sometimes they're still distant. Is it, does, yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean by that. And what what's also very interesting is I, in using these relationships that I've made with women as a resource, sometimes I'll tell them my experience and say, hey, this is what happened. And based on the reaction that they give, kind of like, okay, Maybe I can be upset about this. Maybe this is something worth, you know, worth getting upset about. So I'll like tell the same story to, you know, my circle at different times to gauge their responses and say, oh, okay, this is something that person was being rude to me. That mm -hmm. person was being passive aggressive. That person, oh, they said, what? Yeah. Yeah. Basically what I hear you saying is that, that, you know, extroverted feeling or harmony that's what oftentimes lets us know whether or not behavior was appropriate and what and was it, is it okay if somebody treats me that way is that all right and I do something similar I outsource it a lot of times now I don't yeah. I, I I mean sometimes people think I should be mad when I'm I just don't see the sense in being mad like the per person's <laughs> behavior was inappropriate but it didn't it was no harm no foul and I didn't care but sometimes things happen that I don't know I have permission to be offended around. Yeah. And when yeah. I talk to people who have more sophisticated extroverted feeling or harmony and they're like, oh, yeah, you totally are allowed to be mad about that. That totally shouldn't happen. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm allowed to be upset. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I would also say that even people that use extroverted feeling or harmony as a strength do this, too. That's true. I mean, that is what a group of extroverted feeling users are doing in a, in a group setting is they're 
calibrating the expectations mm -hmm. and the social acceptability or non-acceptability of things. So it's it's something I think all extroverted feeling harmony does. I, I do want to bring attention to something though, Kristen. We did. I mean, we talked a little bit about you not being able to shower at, at one point <laughs> in this show, right? We're talking about your hygiene, and you're like, <laughs> I, I struggle with showering. And then right after that, I asked you this idea of emotional processing, and you said, Well, I come home and I take a shower or a bath, and I take care. I light a candle, and I'm realizing just how much self care and emotional processing is connected for you. And yes. I don't know if that's for all INTPs, but I, I am hearing this connection point of there's something there. I just wanted to bring highlight to if you have any comments on that. Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that I, you know, for a while, I even like subscribed to the magazine Cosmopolitan to like get more insight on, <laughs> on women. And, you know, they talk about like a lot of this stuff. And right now, a huge trend is self-care and like you know, making sure that you have a safe space and like all of this stuff. And I'm like, okay, but what is that? What does that mean to me? Like, what does that actually facilitate for me? And so in order for me to get into like, cause right now I have still, like, I still associate emotions with feminine things, like with femininity. So when I, what I cosplay as a feminine, you know, feminine female, mm -hmm. then I, I'm able to like tap into those emotions. Mm -hmm. So I just shift into that backseat by like, oh, I'm doing girly things. I'm taking care of myself. And in doing that, I'm allowing these emotions to express themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that I have a tendency to say, think in the same way. And I think that when uh, and I, somebody with INTP preferences who identifies as a man, I think when they have a similar uh, challenge, there's there's that association we make. There's the association we make with like fem, you know, like emotional self care as being more of a feminine thing. But I think I'm starting to really understand the importance of tapping into all of that and detangling those expectations. It's it's almost like a misread that we have with our extroverted feeling or harmony overvaluing the social conditioning we get in some ways. Like, I think that's the challenge is that that part of us, we tend to either reject or we overattach. We go, okay, so this is a conflation of these two things, right? I, I must be doing that. This is how it must work because that's what society is telling me or that's how society is telling me that it works. And, um, and I've had sort of a similar thing. And I'm thinking about like, what if, uh, you know, the listener is an INTP who doesn't identify as a woman and yet they need to do emotional processing as well. I think understanding that this is something that uh, that is required for particularly people who lead with a thinking function, that this is really difficult to tap into no matter what. But then if you layer on all of these societal expectations and you don't know that you're allowed to deny them, like those are the societal expectations that you think that you're supposed to be observing or obeying, it can get really complicated to really get into that emotional experience. So I think um, I think what you're talking about with the self care and uh, and that association you're making, I think we all kind of make that association, or at least we're encouraged to. And right. I wonder if there's value in detethering that and going like, uh, maybe I'm not getting into my feminine space. Maybe I'm just getting into my emotional processing space. But as a woman, there is something sort of. Uh, as an, a fellow NCP woman, I think there's a value in also seeing this as like, this is my rite of passage. This is my birthright as a woman, right? You know what I mean? It's like, this is part mm -hmm. of what comes along with it is that if I tap into the feminine, I keep using this phrase, the feminine matrix, because that's kind of how I see it, like this sort of collective mm -hmm. of femininity. But if I tap into it, there's also a lot of like power, there, there's a lot of power in tapping into that and remembering that I do have a right to do all of this and I have a right to self-care and I have a right to emotionally express and process. I think in some ways, for those of us who are wired as NTPs that are women, we have an advantage in that we are encouraged mm -hmm. to get into that space. And so we we aren't allowed to be so one-sided. Like we're like the yeah. world doesn't give us the 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 ability to be one-sided. It encourages us to go to that space. Whereas I think for men who are INCPs, they are encouraged to be more one-sided. So in some ways they're in almost a worse situation. Yeah, I would agree with that. I used to think like, oh, life would be so much easier for me. And there wouldn't be so much societal pushback if I was born male. 
And then I was like, no, I feel like if I feel like being born female, like this is given me an advantage of, oh, I get to experience a lot of things that my male co- counterparts can't uh, societally can't right. um, and are shamed around. And I feel like I've been able to grow a lot more because of, you know, the research that I've done and pushing myself in these ways. Well, it's it's one of those things where it's like you get advantages and disadvantages both ways. Right. Yeah. Like it's more it's more sort of the uh, gender stereotype to be thinking dominant as a man. So in some ways it's a little easier with those expectations, but then there's not as much encouragement to get out of the comfort zone. And yeah. and whereas we have more of an encouragement to get out of the comfort zone, but we also have probably more feelings of like, I'm a complete and total weirdo. <laughs> Why am I right. so weird? <laughs> so it's it's uh, it's what it's what do they call it? Like uh, six, six tens or six twelves, half a dozen of the other, whatever yeah. the expression is. Six to one. Six to one. There you go. <laughs> Or 13 to 1, Baker's dozen to the other. I don't I know. know. Whatever it is. <laughs> Whatever the expression <laughs> is. Uh, so I actually, just to make a comment to this, so for if, for you, INTP male who's listening right now, you're not a female, you're, you're not identifying in these these ways. I do know an INTP who practiced self-care also. On, on their calendar, he would schedule weekly or monthly times or bi-weekly times to clip his nails and trim his hair and do basic grooming and, and things like this. And I think it was part of part of a growth practice for him to take care of himself. So I don't think this is something that that men don't necessarily do. I think there is a there is a caretaking. I'm trying to be more in self-care as well. Well, I'm not. I, I think when we talk, talk about self-care, we're not just talking about hygiene. I mean, we did uh, mention hygiene a lot, but I think we're talking about emotional processing specifically. Well, what I'm saying is if that's yeah. an avenue for self-care, right. if, if, if getting in a warm bath, lighting a candle isn't your thing, maybe there's other ways to... Maybe self-care for, for you as a male is is strengthening your body. I mean, I know another INTP who's extremely into weightlifting. Like he was one of our recent profile training students. He's an INTP. He looks jacked. Like he's focuses on his physicality. Right. I think that's been a way he's been able to emotionally process too through his physical, you know, exertion and things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think at the end of the day though, I mean, there's these stereotypes that INTPs struggle with some of these things, but I think that when an INTP places priority and understands that, like Kristen, you were saying that there's like these seasons and moments in the timeline yeah. and you can give yourself permit. Like you don't have to completely reject it, but maybe you do for a time, maybe for a time period, you do have to reject the societal norms in order to find yourself. And maybe mm-hmm. later on down the line, you don't do as much rejection. Maybe right now this is a time period to sort of plug into the societal norms and that will help facilitate your life. It's almost more of like a flexibility for grabbing whichever tool is right for the moment and not getting too attached to any specific way of thinking or, you know, like like get a, a too entrenched in, like you were saying, an identity, but have some mm-hmm. flexibility in there. Well, and I would actually, I would actually say that that's what the NE growth is: is not allowing yourself to get stagnant or plateau in this certain mindset of either I'm attaching fully to societal expectations or I am rejecting them fully. Kristen, if you were to travel back in time to meet Kristen at 15 and sit down with Kristen and say, Kristen, I have some stuff to tell you. First of all, you're an INTP. And then dot, dot, dot. What advice would you have for your younger self? So maybe an INTP is listening right now. would love to hear from you as an older, wiser, seasoned INTP. I'm sure you're still on your journey, but I'm sure you're wiser than you were at 15. What do you have to say to that person? I would say that mistakes help you learn. And you will make mistakes and it is okay. That's like the biggest one. I would also tell myself to keep a journal and journal just to keep track of your thoughts. I don't actually recommend reading it. Don't read it back to yourself, but keep a journal, keep keep your thoughts somewhere and then reframe the care tasks, reframe either taking care of yourself or your environment. It's one of the hugest leverage points for me was changing the word routine to the word ritual. 
That's what I would tell myself is it's something that you get to do. You don't have to do it. Mm, changing routine to ritual. That's mm-hmm. a good, that's a, uh, that's a really good reframe. So I think that's a fantastic place to end this show, to land the plane for this show. Kristen, thank you so much for bringing your wisdom, your insight, uh, your articulation to Personality Hacker today. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me, guys. So what do you think? You've been here listening to Kristen, Antonia, myself talk. You haven't had a microphone, but you've been the fourth person in this conversation. Now's your time to be heard. Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this show. Leave a comment, ask a question. More importantly, share your personal story. We'd love to hear what your experience is like. Are you an INTP? Maybe you're an INTP woman that struggles with some of the stuff that Kristen talked about today. Or maybe you're uh, an INTP male that has a different set of challenges. want to hear what those are. Maybe you're in your growth journey and you figured some stuff out. We want to hear some advice or wisdom you may have to share for other people in the community. Or you've got an INTP in your life. What's it like to be in a relationship, friendship, partnership with that person? We want to hear from you. Come over to personalityhacker.com and make your voice heard. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave us a rating and review on iTunes, that helps us out a lot. We've got a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. If you leave a rating and review on Amazon or on Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. You heard Kirsten talk about her cognitive functions as an INTP and navigating through them, understanding who she is and leverage points in her personality by understanding those different parts of how her mind is wired. That's part of what you get in the Personality Hacker book. When you discover your best fit type, you have your cognitive functions laid out in front of you and all the different ways that you can see them and create a a relationship with them that will help you become the best version of yourself. We also have a suite of programs that are available at personalityhacker.com. If you look at our catalog of programs, you'll see that they're personal growth oriented through the lens of personality type. If you're ready to take your growth to the next level, go check out those programs and see if there's one that's right for you. My name is Joe Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning. We are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.